Hello again, this is Tony Wright, First Love Christian Church, or FLCC, and A.B. Wright Ministries. We're still in the 90-day Bible study, day 31, uh, 1 Chronicles 24 and 1 through 2 Chronicles 7 and 10. So here the chronicler, though, he continues to lay out how the various functions are to be carried out. Now, Aaron's sons, they're to work as priests and Levites. So the individual assignments work for such duties, right? So in order to determine though, which families would be given which assignments, the common practice, as you can probably tell, was to cast lots. Now, we see that pretty often, don't we? Anytime that things are to be distributed and the one that's to perform that distribution and that they want to make the process seem to be fair and not have the appearance of favoritism or preference, right? You'll likely see uh, that this is accomplished by some method of, yep, casting lots. Now, what the heck is casting lots? What in the world? Well, you can think of it as drawing numbers or a similar process, right? They often use stones or some other uh, object. And each party that was involved, you know, on that receiving end was represented by one of those objects. And as the objects were thrown or drawn, uh, that would determine uh, those individuals or those groups place in the process. So here, Aaron's family was given assignments based on how the lots uh, were cast. Now, the first positions, though, were for those that would be operating as governors of the sanctuary and governors of the house of God, meaning those that would be running the sanctuary and running the, the tabernacle. Right? Uh, some of those positions went to each family since uh, there were priests and Levites from both families that were still represented. Remember, there were four families, two didn't have living uh, 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 descendants. So Aaron, remember, was the first high priest. So his sons and family had held positions in those roles. Then came the musicians. And then included those who had skills with the harp and the psaltery and the cymbals and the horn. And the number of, of them total was 288, as you can see. And uh, uh, by lots, there were 24 families that were to be assigned 12 positions in each of those family groups. The next duties, though, that were to be assigned was that of a porter. We also like to think of that as gatekeepers or temple guards, right? Well, these guards were assigned uh, to the following work schedule. You know, each, each day there were six guards to be on duty on the east side of the temple, uh, four were to be on duty on the north side, four on the south side. Then there were two guards to be stationed at each of two of the storerooms, storerooms for the tabernacle, right? And then four were stationed along the road uh, leading to the west courtyard, and two guards were in the court itself. When you look at the diagram of the uh, tabernacle, you see that. Then there were guards and officers in charge of just guarding the temple treasury and the gifts that had been dedicated to God that were stored there in the uh, temple. So Laden and many of his uh, the other descendants were responsible for guarding that treasury. Uh, and other guards at the treasury were from the Korathite clans of Amram, Izar, Hebron, Uzel, uh, Shimola. And their relatives, they were in charge of all the gifts that were dedicated to the Lord. Now, those gifts included the gifts that had been given by David, that had been dedicated by him, as well as those that were dedicated uh, by the family and uh, army officers and army commanders. And whenever valuable things were captured in battle, remember, they would bring those back. They called them spoils, right? So these men brought, uh, you know, some of those back to the temple. And uh, Shemalaw, and his relatives were responsible for any gifts that had been given to the temple, including those from Samuel the prophet, King Saul, Abner, Joab. Uh, now, the responsibility of the captain of the host was a monthly rotation role that fell to a different family each month. And each month they had to put forth 24,000 people for that role. Now, the chronicler went out, went on to outline that, you know, there were overseers of the king's treasures as well. You know, King Solomon, King David, they had enormous wealth. And uh, they were in charge of the storehouses that were there. And they were the people in charge of vineyards and olive trees, sycamore trees, herds, flocks. Uh, it was all laid out and documented. <laughs> Boy, I'm going to tell you something. To me, that's just big time impressive, the amount of documentation and, inf and information that was stored there. Then he went on to recount the instructions that David gave for building the temple, where David stood up and he called uh, for the attention of the people and then began telling them that he had 
uh, had had it in his heart to build the temple, but God had said to him that he had been a man of war and had shed much blood, so he would not build the house of the Lord, but that his son would be the one that built it. Now, David stated how blessed he was, though, that God had even chosen him in the first place, even though uh, he was not the eldest in his family. But because God liked it, God chose it and decided that David would be king of all of Israel. And then he was also blessed that God gave him a son that would sit on that throne. And likewise, his son wasn't the eldest, but God had chosen him. And truly, God had chosen Solomon. And, and he was thankful that God would establish his kingdom forever through David. And that if Solomon would serve God with all his heart and do that which is right, that the land which God had given them would be an inheritance for their children for generations to come. And David, uh, you know, he passed on the plans of the temple to Solomon and he provided much of the material that was going to be required for the building of the temple. And the people, you know, after he gave his speech, the people, they gave, they contributed. They gave willingly to that mission uh, for getting this huge project accomplished. And they were grateful to be able to give. And, and David gave praise to God and said, I praise you forever, Lord. You are the God of our ancestor Jacob and where he worshiped. And your power is great and your glory is seen everywhere in the heaven and on earth. You are king of the entire world and you rule in strength and power. You make people rich and powerful and famous and we thank you, our God, and we praise you. But why should we be happy that you've given, uh, that we have given you these gifts? Because they belong to you and, and we have only given back what is already yours. <laughs> now, is that the truth or what? Boy, we like to act like we did so much or that we have so much. When everything that we do and every single thing that we have is attributable to God and to God only. And the chronicler, he reflected that Solomon uh, was strengthened in the kingdom, you know, as, as time progressed. And that the Lord God was with Solomon and God was magnifying Solomon greatly. So God appeared to Solomon and, and asked him, you know, what shall I give you? And Solomon told him that, he had shown great favor to his father, David. And he asked God, uh, would you give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people? For who can judge thy people? <laughs> they, they are so great. And God told him that since he didn't ask for riches and wealth and honor, a long life, but that he asked for wisdom to judge God's people, that he would grant those things to him. and it, But he would also grant him Still, those riches and wealth and honor more than any king before and more than any king that was to come after. So then Solomon began the great task of building this temple. And to do that, he engaged the assistance of this man from Tyre named Hiram. Or as the chronicler wrote, uh, and they call him here in the Chronicles, Hiram, right? And Hiram brought all of his skills to bear on this project, both in building, work, and family work right, with the metal fixtures and the overlays. And this craftsmanship of Hiram was critical for all the cast items that they, that went into the building of the temple, all the pots and, uh, you know, candlesticks and you name it. So when the temple was completed, uh, they brought in all the treasures and instruments and all the things that had been dedicated by David before uh, when the tabernacle and the ark was traveling in the, in, in the wilderness. So uh, all that was brought in to, the, to this new temple as well as the gold and silver that had been dedicated by David. And they brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation uh, and all the holy vessels. Now, these things were brought up by the Levites, because remember, well, when someone that was not a Levite had touched the ark, it was like, poof, you're out of here. And when the ark was put in place and the priest came out and the Levites lifted up praise with song and cymbals and harp and psaltery, then the whole house was filled with a cloud. And the priest couldn't even stand to minister for the glory of the Lord that it filled the house. Boy, what in the world? Do you know anything about not being able to stand when the glory of God has filled the house? Somebody help me, please. Oh, my goodness. And Solomon, he went on to bless the entire congregation. And then he prayed. And he, in this prayer, he praised God for being a God that keeps his covenant. 
And Solomon asked God to hearken to the voice of his children, to these, you know, the voice of these Israelites. Whenever they've done wrong or trespassed or they've fallen short or they've sinned, no matter what the infraction. But if those individuals would just acknowledge their wrong and return to God and confess his name and that God, he wanted God to hear them and forgive them. Uh, and he wanted to know that God would hear their prayers and their supplication and maintain and keep their cause uh, because they had acknowledged that they were wrong. And now, now this writer was intent on refreshing the memories of these people. And for those generations that came after the exile that had no memory of the greatness of God's people before that time, this writer is putting this before them that they might know who they are as God's chosen people and a people of promise. And the writer wants them to understand that God's covenant is still valid and his promises are still true and their future is still there. But it starts with them being obedient to God's word and with them following his ways and, and setting their hearts to fulfill the commandments of God. All of what they had, they still can have. And God's people have, at this point had had in their uh, past, had had the best. But it was lost, not because God is not faithful, but because his people were not faithful. Now, the chronicler was writing to energize these people that they would choose to follow God. Hey, speaking of follow, I hope you keep following this word. Keep on reading. You know, you're almost at the one third mark. right? In fact, you just passed the one third mark. So you keep checking us out on your favorite social media platform. And whatever you do, tell your friends. Tell your neighbors, FLCC, we're bringing kingdom ministry to human needs for spiritual growth. And we're taking ministry back to the first love. Peace.